everybody. So how many of you out there have had something so catastrophic happen to you that in an instant your life was changed forever? Show of hands. Well, my husband Tom and I have. Even though it was a terrible ordeal in the beginning, it uncovered a forgotten miracle cure that had been lost almost for 100 years. And it could turn out that this will save thousands, if not millions, of lives. Our story began when we were on vacation in Egypt in 2015. We were exploring the pyramids, and Tom was as fit as a fiddle, or at least I thought so. Oh, sure, you know, he was overweight, but who doesn't have a few extra pounds? That didn't stop him from climbing 300 feet down backwards in the dark to explore a pyramid outside of Cairo. But a couple of days later, after we'd had this romantic candlelight meal on top of this luxury cruise ship on the upper deck under the stars, Tom became violently ill. He vomited all night long. And I thought, oh gee, he's just got food poisoning. And I pulled out a couple of antibiotic pills that we take with us on our trips and I gave it to him with some water. Nothing happened. The next day he was so sick that I summoned a doctor to the ship. The doctor rushed him in an ambulance to a local clinic in Luxor because there's no hospitals in Luxor. There he was diagnosed with pancreatitis and inflammation of the pancreas. Since some complications started to arise and Tom was absolutely getting delirious, we were successful in getting him medevaced to Frankfurt, Germany. And there he was diagnosed with something even worse. Well, first a gallstone had gotten stuck in his bile duct and it had caused this giant abscess the size of a football to form. But inside that abscess lurked something much more terrible a superbug, a bacteria by the name of Acinetobacter baumannii. It's so hard to pronounce, we're just gonna call it Arachibacter. That's the nickname that it got because so many veterans came back from the Middle East with this bacterial infection that they called it Arachibacter. Now, recently, the World Health Organization made a list of the most deadliest superbugs in the world and Arachibacter was public enemy number one. And since the first Superbug was identified in 1961, and that was MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, for you scientists out there. It's superbugs have spread to every corner of the world. Right now, they kill about 700,000 people per year, but it's estimated that by 2050, they could kill up to 50, up to 10 million people per year by 2050. And that would outstrip the number of deaths due to cancer. So this is a global crisis. The United Nations, the Centers for Disease Control, the World Health Organization say that this is one of the number one threats to global health around the world. So the question arises, how did we get into this mess? Well, our reliance as a society on antibiotics has been going on for quite some time now. Doctors sometimes prescribe antibiotics when they're not needed because there's no rapid test to kind of differentiate between one bacteria and another or a viral infection from a bacterial infection. And patients like us sometimes don't take their antibiotics when they're, the way they're supposed to. We stop taking them when we feel better and then that promotes resistance too. But actually, you may not know this, but the biggest culprit that's promoting antimicrobial resistance in the world right now is actually antibiotics given to livestock. You know, pigs, cattle, chickens. And that's not to prevent or treat disease, that's to make them fatter because we are addicted to meat. So unless there is a global ban on the indiscriminate use of antibiotics in livestock, this trend is gonna continue and gonna get worse, a lot worse. Another contributor to antimicrobial resistance is poor infection control. Your mama was right. You should always wash your hands and you can prevent a lot of infections that way. But these days, some of our most powerful disinfectants can actually make superbugs stronger. And up to 15% of patients entering hospitals can acquire a bacterial infection while they're in there. Many of these are superbugs. Now, We'll never really know for sure where Tom got his superbug infection, but we do know that it was an Egyptian strain. And we know that by the time he was medevaced home to San Diego, that it was resistant to every antibiotic, even the last ditch salvage therapies like colistin and carbapenems. And the doctors told me, these were our colleagues, that Tom 
was going to die. This photo was taken soon after they told us, his daughters and I, that he wasn't going to make it. And he was in a coma by now. He had been for a couple months. And his eyes were fluttering this day, and I took his hand and I said, Honey, I, I want to grow old with you, but I don't want you to stay alive just because I want you to. If you want to fight, I will leave no stone unturned. I'll find out something that can help. But I need to know if you want to live. So if you want to live, will you squeeze my hand? I waited, and I waited, and he squeezed my hand. I pumped my fist into the air, but then I thought, oh shit, what do I do now? You know? Now luckily, I'm not just the wife of a really cool guy. I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist. <laughs> now, now, mind you, I'm not a medical doctor, so it didn't do me much good, but I went home that night and I started researching alternative treatments for superbug infections, and I found this paper that mentioned this obscure therapy called bacteriophage therapy, or phage therapy for short. So I know you're wondering by now, what the heck is a bacteriophage? Well, these little guys almost look like lunar landers on the moon, but they're not. This is an electron micrograph of bacteriophages attacking a bacterium. Now, phages are tiny viruses, 100 times smaller than a bacteria, and they just gobble these bacteria up. They're the oldest and most populous organism on the planet, and they're found wherever bacteria are found. So they're found in soil, water, on our skin, in our guts, and we poop them out. So guess where they're found? In sewage. Yeah. So how do you get phages out of sewage? Well, I'm going to share a little high school experiment with you. First, you get a Petri dish and with some agar on it. And you streak it with the bacteria. This time, it's actually our pal, Acinetobacter bomanii. And those little glossy globs are actually bacterial colonies. Now, you get a drop of sewage, and you plunk it on that Petri dish and you incubate it for 24 to 48 hours, and it might end up looking like this, a little bit like Swiss cheese, don't you think? And that's because phages have been attacking these bacterial colonies, and wherever you see a little hole, that means phages have been hard at work gobbling them up. So you can take a pipette and suck out that stuff, not with your mouth, mind you, and, you know, Put it in broth with more bacteria, and phages will multiply ad infinitum. So at a molecular level, it's even more fascinating because bacteriophages are very finicky. They only attack the bacteria that they are a match to. So they're bopping along in there, and when they see a bacteria that looks like it might interest them, they go, go over and they latch onto it with, through their receptor, and they shoot the DNA from their head into the bacterial cell, which takes over the machinery of the bacterium and turns it into a phage manufacturing plant. These baby phages, known as virions, assemble inside the bacterial cell until they're given the kill signal and they burst out of the bacterial cell, blowing it to smithereens. Well, I was blown away by this and I wondered, could phage therapy be actually used in humans? Well, somebody had actually thought about this long before I ever did. This guy by the name of Felix Durrell, a French-Canadian scientist, who'd used it to treat dysentery in children with some success. Phage therapy actually had a bit of a heyday in the 1920s and 30s, but when penicillin, the first antibiotic, came along right around World War II, phage therapy was relegated to the back burner. In fact, it's only being regularly used in parts of Eastern Europe till this day. So that means it's not licensed by the Food and Drug Administration in the United States. It's considered experimental. But that didn't stop me. I wondered, could we use phage therapy to save Tom? Well, I knew I couldn't do this alone. You know, I'm, I'm not an MD, and this sounded pretty crazy, but nevertheless, we were desperate. I contacted Chip Schooley, who's the head of infectious diseases at UC San Diego, a friend of ours who'd been helping us treat Tom since he fell sick in the beginning. 
And I said, what do you think about phage therapy, Chip? We're running out of options here. And he said, you know, what an intriguing idea. If you can find some phages that can match Tom's bacterial isolate, I'll call the FDA and get permission and give it a whirl. And I thought, oh, super, this is great. And then I thought, oh my God, where am I gonna find some phages? I don't know, like this is kind of getting out of hand. So I took this photo of Tom wearing this T-shirt that said, I survived Arachobacter. And at the time, he was barely surviving. He was on life support. And I wrote a list out uh, from the internet of all the phage researchers I could find that were in the United States. And I asked them for help. I told our story. And the next day, a total stranger, Dr. Ryland Young from who, uh, Texas A&M University, he wrote back and he said, you know, your story really touched me. If you send me his bacterial isolate, I only have two phages that are active against Arachobacter, but I'll give them a try and I'll also test them out on some environmental samples. You know what those are, right, everybody? <laughs> Sewage. Anyway, I said, sure, absolutely. And he said, well, I'll also write all my phage researcher friends around the world and I'll ask them to send us some phages and we'll see if we have a match. We need, he said, several different kinds of phages so that we don't get resistance in the bacteria. So he started to do a phage hunt and I contacted Chip and I said, Chip, we're gonna get some phages here, it looks like. And so Chip said, wow, I'm gonna call the FDA and get this whole permission thing teed up. The FDA were amazingly helpful. They put us in touch with another lab we never would have found. They're from the US Navy, and they've been doing phage research too. Now this isn't Tom Cruise, guys. This is actually Lieutenant Commander Theron Hamilton, who has a PhD, and he heads up the Biodefense Command Lab at the Navy Medical Research Center in Frederick, Maryland. So Theron got the help of Dr. Biswajit Biswas, who's affectionately known as the Phage Whisperer, and I'm, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not making this up, it's hard to believe. Uh, and he, also, the, his mentor, Dr. Carl Merrill, who used to be heading up a phage research lab at the NIH, and they found some phages too. So within another week, we had this concoction in a bag of a couple billion phages, and I turned to Chip and I said, Chip, how did you know what dose of phages to get prepared? And he looked at me in all confidence and said, I didn't. We're making this up as we go along. And I thought, oh no. But by now, we actually didn't have any, any, any course because Tom was now entering multi-system organ failure. His lungs were, had been failing, his heart had been failing, and now his kidneys were failing. And the day that we started phage therapy was the day that I signed a consent form for kidney dialysis. But the worst consent form was the one that I had to sign that said, I know my husband's dying. I know this is an unproven, untested treatment that could kill him because it's from sewage, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So it was the scariest day of my life, March 15th, 2016. He'd been in the hospital now for four months. We injected the phages first into the catheters in his abdomen because that's where they were close to the Arachobacter infection. But because he was fully colonized, two days later we had to inject them into his bloodstream through his pick line. Because if any reservoir of bacteria were left, resistance would occur. Now this was in infinitely riskier. In fact, even the folks in Eastern Europe don't generally inject phages into the bloodstream due to the risk of septic shock. And one of Tom's daughters turned to Chip and said, so what do we do now? And Chip said, we wait and we hope we have the most boring 24 hours we've ever had. So we waited, and we waited, and three days later, Tom woke up. I mean, it was just crazy. He lifted his head off the pillow, recognized his oldest daughter, and kissed her hand. Within a week or two, Tom was actually off all life support. Now he'd lost all of his muscle and he had to be helped to even sit up or had to be taught how to swallow and talk again. We, we weren't out of the woods, there were lots of ups and downs, but Tom, it turns out, was the first person to receive intravenous phage therapy in the United States to treat a systemic bacterial infection that was multidrug resistant. 
And the, the publicity that his case has gotten has spurred an international interest in phage therapy when it had been considered a real fringe before. After three months, his own body cleared the infection and he was discharged in August 2016, where he came home. Now, several people have actually been treated with intravenous phage therapy as a direct result of Tom's case. And this summer, we had the privilege of meeting a new friend, John, who's being treated with phage therapy at the University of California San Diego Hospital where Tom was treated. Now, these are only case reports. A lot more research will need to be done in order for phage therapy to be rolled out to the masses, but it's such an incredible first start. So it took a village to save Tom Patterson. But the most important person was Tom himself. His dedication and his love of life are awe-inspiring. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you my husband, my miracle man, Tom Patterson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm, uh, I'm only gonna say a few words. I'm 100 pounds lighter. This isn't a diet that I'm trying to market, I assure you. <laughs> um, I'm an HIV researcher in my working life, and I never would have expected to say that viruses have become our best allies against bacteria. I know that, you know, my experience has moved the field forward a number of, uh, it's been apparently about a decade that it's moved it forward. I'm hoping that if I can save one life because of my experience, that it's been a, all worthwhile. So I thank you very much. Thank you, baby. Thank you.